Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro, and I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, if, you, if you've already heard about the controversy regarding the failed attempts at Bethel to raise a two-year-old girl from the dead, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to like the video and ring the bell so that you can be notified when we update the channel. Today, is my, it's my intention that this will be the last nail in the coffin regarding this failed attempt to raise Olive from the dead. Yeah, pun intended. In fact, you can kind of think of it as a theological post-mortem. Yeah, I know. I'll just keep them coming dry, but you, you get the idea. And this is an important one because Bethel Church is part of the New Apostolic Reformation. They believe that God has restored prophets to the world and restored apostles. And a, a particular apostle that you may be familiar with is Bill Johnson himself. The, you know, the claim at Bethel is that he is an apostle. Well, the uh, failed attempt to raise Olive from the dead proves that Bill Johnson is not an apostle. He's a false apostle. And I wanted to do a little bit of work on this. Go back into the video, just point out again his theology, his claim that they've been commanded to raise the dead. Note that that is one of the signs of the apostles. And then we're going to spend uh, just a little bit of time taking a look in the book of Exodus as to what is the purpose of signs, and then look at two accounts in the book of Acts and note how the church worked when it came to raising two people from the dead. And so, and then consider the implications as it relates to the claims of the NAR that God has restored apostles to the earth and that uh, Bill Johnson of Bethel is one of them. So let me uh, pull my desktop up and get my screen here rolling. Let me remind you what Bill Johnson said regarding the command that apparently the church has to raise the dead. Let's hear him again. And then when you add to that, that he commanded his followers, his disciples, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils, to cleanse lepers. None of those are things that we can actually do. And yet he commanded us because somehow in our yes, he gives us the ability to carry out his mission. Being commissioned means we've said yes to his mission. All right, so there you go. Reminder that he was talking about <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10, apparently telling us that we are commanded to raise the dead. Now, let me remind you from the biblical text, from context, again, context, context, context will apply here, that this is not a command, this is not an authority given to the church in general. This was an authority given specifically to the apostles, and we can show that in the book of Acts very clearly. But I wanted to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork, remind you again that Bill Johnson claimed that we are commanded by Christ. I will repeat what I said in my previous video. Well, if that's the case, then the church has been disobeying Jesus for 1,900 years, which makes no sense at all. Yeah, not, not at all. So coming back to uh, Matthew chapter 10, let's take a look at this. And again, just the context. So Jesus called to him uh, his 12 disciples. N note, this is the context is talking about the 12. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits. Notice it says gave them, the 12. The context tells us who he gave the authority uh, to, you know, to in this case, to heal every disease, every affliction. Um, you know, so you, you got the idea. And then he names the 12. 12 apostles are Simon, P, uh, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed them. These 12, again, note, exegetically, you have to note that this is Christ speaking specifically to these 12. Some of you in the comment section on uh, one of our previous videos here, so how do we know the difference? The context is going to make that distinction for you, so pay attention to your context. And this is where uh, an understanding of the biblical languages also helps, because oftentimes when people twist a command for a people group, 
they will say, you know, they will make it specific to you. And so uh, in Hebrew and in Greek, there is a you plural. And, you know, so we like to say y'all. Uh, and so pay attention to the y'alls if you have access to the biblical languages to d determine whether or not this was given to a specific group of people or to an individual or to you as the church. The context will always dictate that. So these 12 then Jesus sent out instructing, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Again, this is an authority given to the 12, and the context makes it perfectly clear. Now, that being the case, let's consider then what are the purpose of these types of signs. And sign gifts, uh, the ability to work in sign miracles, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament and to Moses. Moses is first fellow to be able to operate in, in sign uh, miracles, and we'll see what the purpose is for them. And in Exodus chapter 4, then, we read, uh, while Moses is talking to uh, God, uh, from, who's speaking to him from the burning bush, it says, Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. They will say, Yahweh did not appear to you. So Moses is anticipating that there will be scoffers and skeptics saying, Listen, there's, God didn't talk to you. Go back to the wilderness, you weirdo. And and so he's he's giving a you know a valid potential criticism that he would receive by showing up to the people of Israel, saying that the Lord has appeared to me. He's going to set you free from captivity to Pharaoh. We need to go and tell Pharaoh to the, the Yahweh says, "Let my people go." Yeah, and they, some of them would sit there and go, "What? Where did you come from?" Right. So. Um, so they will not believe me. They will say, the Lord Yahweh did not appear to you. So Yahweh said to him, what is in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But Yahweh said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe. Now, note, the Lord is now talking here that they may believe that Yahweh, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And so the purpose of a sign gift is to validate that the person being sent by God was truly sent by them. And so Moses, in a sense, is an apostle. He's sent by God. He's given signs that validate that he was sent by God. Now, apostle in the Greek means, you know, one who is sent. It's like an emissary. So if you were to show up in the ancient world, it's a, it's a common term. It's not an uncommon term. And, and somebody were to say, hey, listen, I'm an apostle. They would immediately ask the question, well, who sent you? You're an apostle of whom? And so you'll note that the disciples, uh, they, with regularity, say who they are apostles of. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, let me go into Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1, um, Paul says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So Paul says that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus. That is also, again, echoed in Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and, uh, and God the Father. So Paul claimed to be an apostle. Apostle of whom? An apostle of Jesus Christ. And then when we take a look at Peter's credential, credentials, first Peter begins with the words, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle of Jesus Christ. Now that being the case, you know, these men are not claiming to just be mere emissaries. They are claiming to be specifically sent by Jesus himself. So Jesus sent Paul. Jesus sent Peter. Jesus sent the other 12. You get the idea. And he gave them authority, and he gave them sign gifts that validated that they were sent by him in the same way Moses received sign miracles from God, uh, the ability to take his staff, throw it to the ground, and it becoming a snake, 
and then picking up by its tail and it becomes a staff again. The ability to take his hand, put it in its, his cloak and pull it out and it would be leprous, put it back into his cloak and it would no longer be leprous, as well as the ability to take water and turn it into blood. Those were the sign gifts, the sign miracles given to Moses to prove that he was sent by God. So the apostles have sign miracles. They can heal the sick. They can raise the dead. And you're going to note then, if this is consistent, that this, these are gifts given specifically to the apostles, then we should not see in the, in the New Testament that... Uh, let's just say that the common everyday believer in Jesus Christ, who is a convert to Christianity through the preaching and the teaching of the apostles, we, we should expect that they're not going to be operating in those sign gifts. So let me give you two texts in particular where you can kind of see this bear out. And uh, I want to go first to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. By the way, both Tabitha and Dorcas, uh, the, these are words that mean gazelle. That's her name. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days she became ill and she died. And when they had washed her and laid her in an upper room, and so they washed her and laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So you're going to note here, we can say, using Bethel's terms, that these disciples of Jesus were contending for Dorcas's resurrection, for her to be raised from the dead. But note here that they are described as disciples. They are already believers in Jesus Christ. They are described as disciples, and yet they didn't decree, they didn't declare, they didn't proclaim, they themselves didn't even pray for God to raise Dorcas from the dead. Instead, what did they do? They sent to Peter to have Peter come so that he might raise her from the dead. Now, note, Peter doesn't sit there and go, why'd you send for me? You guys could have done this. Jesus commanded you to raise the dead. Why aren't you doing what Jesus told you to do? Why'd you make me come all the way over here, you know, from Joppa in order to, you know, he doesn't do that. Okay, so note here, the disciples recognize that they do not have this authority, and so they are calling for the one who does. And the fact that Peter does this again validates that he is a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not merely a disciple, but that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ sent by Jesus himself, and Jesus gave this authority to Peter as well as to the other apostles of Jesus Christ. So, come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows stood, uh, widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, knelt down, and he prayed. And then turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all the Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Note here, so this sign, which was performed by Peter, not performed by the other believers in Jesus, they, didn't even, they knew they didn't have this authority, they called for Peter, Peter prayed, raised him from the dead. And the result of this sign miracle was that more people, many more people, believed in Jesus. And so he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So you can see that. So again, I point out, if it were true that Jesus commanded the church in general to raise the dead, then the right response from Peter was, would have, should have been, you do it yourself, Jesus commanded you to raise the dead. It's not his response. 
And so this is also then consistent with another re, you know, raising from the dead, and that's the Apostle Paul. Now, apparently Apostle Paul, he wasn't the most gifted of speakers, and um, he, in this particular account, he's apparently droning on, and some poor fellow falls asleep during a sermon, falls out of a window, and dies. And, and so we'll see who performs the miracle. So on the first day of the week when we were gathered, notice this is one of the we sections of uh, the book of Acts, which means Luke, the author of Acts, was present for this. So on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he pro prolonged his speech until midnight. <laughs> Yeah, you think your pastor's sermons are long. Anyway, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, note here, Paul doesn't say to the people there, well, just raise him up, would you? You know, dust him off and raise him from the dead. You're commanded by Jesus to do so. Nope, doesn't say that. And note, Luke doesn't say, I mean, Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, and Luke doesn't even go on the scene to raise him from the dead. But who's the person who has the authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ to raise Eutychus from the dead? Paul does. And so you'll note here, Nobody else comes to his resurrection rescue except for the one who has the authority to raise the dead. And so Paul went down, bent over him, taking him up in his arms. He said, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak. And so he departed, and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So again, note here. When you do your biblical work, not only are we not commanded to raise the dead, the apostles were. The apostles had that authority. It was a sign gift that validated that they were sent by Christ, and that's one of the signs of the apostles. Now, I want you to consider the implications. The implication is this. This fellow, Bill Johnson, claims to be an apostle. And now we have definitive proof that he is incapable, doesn't have the authority to raise the dead, which means he's not an apostle. If he were an apostle, then all of would have been raised from the dead immediately upon his calling her to be alive. But that didn't happen. Day after day after day, on into a week and longer, of their decreeing and declaring, commanding and controlling, and calling Olive to wake up, resulted in nothing happening. Which proves 100%. This man, he ain't an apostle. He's a false apostle. And that means the preachers and teachers there at Bethel are false prophets and false teachers as well. They are a cult, and they should be avoided like the plague. So hopefully you found this helpful. And, you know, again, there's just no way around it. If you can't perform the signs of an apostle, you're not an apostle of Jesus Christ. That group, by the way, is closed. The, you know, there are no living apostles today. And so that's the idea. So warn people, share this video with others on your social media to let them know, to wake them up that, to the dangers of Bethel Church in Redding, California. This is a cult. This man's, and Bill Johnson is a false apostle. Chris Vallotton is a false prophet. These are very, very dangerous people who are misleading people in the name of Jesus and deceiving them and making merchandise of them. In fact, I, one person pretty much said it very well. They, fa they, they failed to raise Olive, but they did succeed in raising over $60,000. Uh, yeah, th th this is true as uh, <clears throat> in the wake of the death of Olive. 
So anyway, share the video. Share the video with others. All the information on how you can share it is down below, as well as the information on how you can support Fighting for the Faith in the work that we are doing. We are supported by the people we serve, and that's you. And so if you don't already support us, all the information on how you can support us is down below in the, in the description. And a little bit of a note, if you join our crew at Gunner's Mate or above, I am a photographer, a professional photographer, and we will send you, as my way of saying thank you, a signed copy of my, uh, of, you know, my photograph, which I've titled All Things London. We'll send you a signed copy of that if you join at Gunner's Mate or above as my way of saying thank you for, uh, for joining our crew. And that particular print will be available. We're going to make it on, available into January, you know, probably through the end of January. And then after that, we're going to change it and put a different print in place. So anybody who joins at Gunner's Mate or above as my way of saying thank you, I'll send you a signed copy, you know, you know with a note from me even <laughs> saying thank you for joining our crew and supporting us. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ in his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen.